Just over a month ago, my beloved mother passed away. Losing a parent is always an extremely painful experience, and many questions naturally come to us. One of these questions is, where is my mother now? What has happened to her? Has my loved one's life really come to an end? Do they exist now in some other dimension? Do they still have consciousness and awareness of my life? The world famous scientist Stephen Hawking said, I regard the brain as a computer which will stop working when its components fail. There is no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. That is a fairy tale story for people afraid of the dark. Now many people subscribe to a less cynical and more sentimental view that those who have died live on in the memories of their loved ones. But this view doesn't really accept the idea that people who have passed away have any real existence. Because once their family and their friends pass away, the memory of the dead will eventually fade away for everyone except for those who are supremely famous. Many people shy away from the idea that people don't really die. Only their bodies decompose, but their true selves, their souls, continue to exist. And people often shy away from such an idea. Ellie Kaplan Spitz is a conservative rabbi who at one time was very skeptical about such a possibility. In the year 2000, he published a book explaining how he came to accept and embrace the belief in the survival of the human soul and the idea of an afterlife. But he writes that he was afraid that people would think of him as gullible and naive and prone to magical thinking. There are many factors that eventually led him to believe in the reality of the immortality of the soul. One of them was the extensive research by academics and scientists over the past 50 years into near-death experiences. The British medical journal Lancet published a report in the year 2001 about life after death. The survey was compiled based upon the reports from patients who experienced clinical death and later returned to full consciousness. One of the most compelling aspects of this and other research on near-death experiences is that virtually identical experiences have been had by people of vastly different backgrounds from all over the world. And these people spoke of being disconnected from their bodies and having profound feelings of peace and calm. Many of the subjects spoke about having a panoramic vision and experiencing their entire lives flashing before them. 
Most of these people describe seeing an awesome light and a feeling that they no longer existed in a body that they once had existed in. And the light radiated warmth and love. Other researchers discovered that a significant percentage of people who were pronounced dead but later came back to life related that when they left their bodies, they passed through a dark tunnel before experiencing this great light. Many of those interviewed reported meeting relatives or friends coming to greet them. Some spoke of encountering beings of light that guided them on their journey. Another common experience was being given an entire life review in one moment from birth until death. Finally, subjects spoke about being given a choice between completely dying or returning to life. And they all preferred going back to their lives, despite the awesome peace and pleasure that they experienced in the other world. And they all gave similar reasons for wanting to return. Number one, for the sake of their friends and relatives that were left behind. Secondly, because they felt they had not yet completed their mission in this world, or they wanted to fix something that they had damaged. Or third, they simply didn't feel that it was their time to leave this world. But all of those who returned said that as a result of the experience that they had, they understood that each person has a purpose in their life. And that purpose is not simply to pursue existence on a physical plane. Dr. Raymond Moody is a psychiatrist at the University of Virginia, was a psychiatrist, and he was a pioneer in the research of near-death experiences. In his book, Life After Life, he deals with various theories that attempt to explain near-death experiences by natural means. These include the possibility of the effects of medications taken by people at the time of their deaths, and various psychological explanations and suggestions of delusions, of dreams, or of hallucinations. Moody dismantled each of these explanations directly and effectively. For example, he points out that most of those interviewed in these studies never received any medication prior to their deaths. In addition, the fact that thousands of people of very different backgrounds and places of origin all over the world had essentially the same experiences precludes the possibility of a natural explanation. The strongest reason for Moody to reject these skeptical theories is that many of those who died, these clinical de deaths, were able to report facts and details about what happened to them when they were completely unconscious, which they had no way of knowing about. And yet somehow these people returned from the dead and were able to report on these things. Another American psychiatrist, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, has seriously researched near-death experiences for over 20 years. And she said, I know beyond a shadow of the doubt that life continues after physical death. She wrote, I am very skeptical at heart, and that is why I tested every aspect 
of this phenomenon with rigor. I discovered, for example, people who were blind from birth describing to me with incredible precision what various people in the room with their body were wearing, the jewelry they had on, and what they did in the room. How could they have known that? Kubler-Ross collected 20,000 anecdotes of near-death experiences while she served on the faculty of the University of Chicago. Aside from the incredible reality that these same kinds of experiences have been reported by many thousands of people from vastly different backgrounds from all over the world, what is even more astounding is that ancient Jewish teachings going back nearly 2,000 years describe the experiences of death in these very same contours. And this was long before scientific explorations of near-death experiences. I'll share a few examples. Number one, the Talmud recounts stories of people who died and came back to life. Many such stories. One was someone who was actually buried and later found alive in the cemetery and who went on to live 25 more years. Ancient mystical writings such as the Zohar describe how those who die see a great and powerful light that emits endless love and communicates with them telepathically. Number three, our ancient literature describes how the dead see scenes of their lives passing before them in rapid chronological order. The Zohar explains that relatives and friends who died previously come to greet the person who has passed away. And the person speaks with them and they accompany the new soul on its journey. The sages describe how the dead can perceive everything taking place around their bodies following their deaths. And the Talmud is replete with stories of how the souls of those who have passed on communicate with people who are still alive. In 2014, Yitta Halberstam and Judith Leventhal published Small Miracles from Beyond, containing numerous short stories showing how we are linked to the other side. One of these stories was about a farmer named James Chaffin from North Carolina. And in 1921, he passed away, and his will stipulated that upon his death, his entire estate would pass to his son, Marshall. Incredibly, his widow and three other sons were left with nothing. This was inexplicable because the entire family always lived together with wonderful relations. However, Marshall didn't end up living long enough to enjoy the fruits of his inheritance. And a year later, he died, and everything was now left to his wife and their lone son. In the afterlife, the senior Mr. Chaffin came to realize that he committed a terrible injustice by disinheriting the rest of his family. So four years after his death, he began making frequent appearances in the dreams of his second son, James Jr. In these dreams, he would stand looking depressed and mournful at his son's bedside, and he didn't say a word. Now, this was unusual because when he was alive, the senior Mr. Chaffin was a tremendous chatterbox. And these visitations continued for several weeks in exactly the same manner until one night the dream changed. 
This time, James Sr. came to his son's bed dressed in an old black overcoat. His son recognized the coat right away. It was his father's overcoat that was frayed after many years of use. And James Sr. opened the front of the coat and spoke to his son for the first time since coming to him in these dreams. He told his son, you will find something about my last will in my overcoat pocket. And then the image of his father disappeared, leaving James Jr. shaking and bewildered, wondering if maybe he wasn't hallucinating. The next morning he awoke with a strong feeling that his father was actually trying to communicate something important to him. And although extremely early in the morning, he went directly to his mother's home to look for the old coat, but it wasn't there. His mother had given the coat to her oldest son, John, and John had moved away to a nearby county. So James Jr. traveled the 20 miles to his brother's home as quickly as he could and began pounding on his brother's door. He excitedly told his brother about the dream from the night before, and the two brothers tore apart the farmhouse for the old coat until they finally found it. At first, they couldn't find anything in any of the pockets. But James Jr. continued to inspect the coat closely, rubbing his fingers over every single inch of the fabric. He finally realized that the inside lining of the coat was cut open and restitched. Sure enough, inside the lining was a piece of paper, rolled up and tied with a string. It wasn't a will. It wasn't any kind of document. It was just a small slip of paper that had a few words scribbled on it. The words said, read the 27th chapter in the book of Genesis from my daddy's old Bible. Now the note was clearly written in James Sr.'s distinctive script the way everyone remembered how he signed his name in a very unique scrawl. So James Jr. headed back to his mother's home, and she said she remembered the Bible, but she had no idea where it might be. So they exhaustively searched through the entire house from room to room, going through closets and cupboards, drawers, Cabinets, finally at the bottom of an old chest in an upstairs room, they found the old Bible. It was somewhat rotted and in pieces, and they turned to Genesis chapter 27 and found two pages folded to form a pocket. Inside was a piece of paper in James Sr.'s unique and verifiable handwriting. And it had the following note. After reading the 27th chapter of Genesis, I, James Chaffin, do make my last will and testament. And here it is. I want, after giving my body a decent burial, my property to be equally divided between my four children. And if she is still living, you must take care of your mommy. Now this is my last will and testament. Witness my hand and seal, January 16th, 1919. Now the original will had been written years earlier, but apparently after seeing the tragic results of an elder son getting disinherited in Genesis chapter 27, he had a change of heart and he drew up a new will two years before passing away. When the family showed this second will to Marshall's widow, she immediately agreed to settle the case out of court, and an amicable 
settlement was reached in the, judge, in the judges' chambers. Now we see phenomena in nature illustrating the reality that existence does not end with death. For example, when a seed is planted into the earth, it completely decomposes and rots before eventually emerging as a tree. It's interesting that in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 19, man is compared to a tree. Caterpillars are born on the kind of leaf that they naturally will eat for nourishment. And caterpillars will consume these leaves until they reach full size and then they stop eating. They then hang upside down from a leaf or a twig and they spin themselves a silky cocoon or they molt into a shiny chrysalis. The chrysalis seems to disintegrate and it looks like the end of whatever was inside of there. But eventually, its body has been radically transformed inside the chrysalis and the former caterpillar emerges from its sack of goo into a beautiful butterfly. Now, after studying thousands of cases of near-death experiences over a period of 20 years, Dr. Kubler-Ross concluded that our physical body is only a chrysalis, an external wrapping of the human essence. The true inner persona, the butterfly in man, is freed at the moment of death. Ultimately, Torah thought is very much in line with this. People often give their assent to the idea that they have a soul. People will say, yes, I have a soul. But the truth is that we don't have a soul. We are a soul. And we have a body. We are a soul. We have a body. Our essence is our soul. We are a soul before we are born and start our career in this world. And we are a soul after this life comes to an end. This is what King Solomon states in his book Koheles, Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 7. He writes, the dust returns to the ground as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. When the Almighty created human beings, we were made as composite beings. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says that God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the soul of life, and man became a living being. We were formed with a physical body, and a spiritual soul. The body will wither and die while the soul lives on forever, bearing the person's consciousness and identity. As we'll soon see, even this is not the real end of the story. And it's crucial for us to understand the full story. Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato was an 18th century Italian mystic and one of the greatest Jewish thinkers of all time. His writings, like the classic Derech Hashem, The Way of God, fill out the picture for us. God's essence is loving and benevolent. As such, he wants to do good and to give. The creation of mankind stemmed from his will to have a recipient to receive his goodness. Just as parents want their children 
to have lives of ultimate fulfillment and pleasure. God's intention is for human beings to experience the ultimate fulfillment and pleasure possible. What is the greatest thing that we are able to experience in life? What is the greatest thing that exists? It would be the possibility of experiencing the infinite. God himself. God is the creator of everything in our world and the source of all other pleasures. To know God and experience him is the ultimate pleasure and bliss that a person could possibly experience. God is obviously not physical, and we don't experience God in the same way that we have pleasure from delicious food. We experience God spiritually, primarily through the spiritual part of who we are, our souls, and not through our bodies. But if our souls existed in a spiritual realm before being fused with a physical body, something wrong seems to have taken place. If our souls were existing prior to coming into this world in a totally spiritual state, why not just leave them there? That's precisely the state of existence where the soul could bask in the presence of the divine and experience eternal bliss. Why send the soul down to this physical world that will only interfere with our ability to relate to God? It's like sending someone to a concert wearing earplugs, headphones, and a blindfold. You can't fully experience God in a physical world. So why send the soul down into this physical world, into a physical body? Especially since it will eventually return to the spiritual realm anyway. It is crucial for us to understand this question. And there are two vitally important reasons for it. Number one, anything good we get without working for it and without earning it is not truly pleasurable. To have been created and left in paradise would not be a true paradise. Another way of putting this is that the measure of a relationship depends upon the extent, the extent the measure of a relationship depends upon the extent that you actually choose it. A relationship that you're forced to have is not a real relationship. To be created fully connected to God in a spiritual world is something that happens to us. We don't really choose it. To choose a relationship with God, there has to be an alternative. We need to decide what we really want. And this is how Rabbi Lutzato explains the dynamic. He writes, the highest wisdom decreed that man should consist of two opposites. These are his pure spiritual soul and his unenlightened physical body. Each one is drawn to its nature so that the body inclines toward the material while the soul leans toward the spiritual. The two are in a constant state of battle. If the soul prevails, it not only elevates itself, but it elevates the body as well. And the individual attains his destined perfection. If he allows the physical to prevail, 
then besides lowering his body, he also debases his soul. Such an individual makes himself unworthy of perfection and separates himself from God. He still has the ability, however, to subjugate the physical to his soul and intellect and thereby achieve perfection. Human beings always have the possibility of rectifying their mistakes, of returning on the proper path. Now the sages speak, our sages speak, of the compound being created of physical dust and spiritual breath with the imagery of a horse and its rider. The horse is basically all body, it's all physical. All it wants to do is to eat and to drink and to sleep and to mate with other horses and to run around and to play. That's all the horse wants to do. Our bodies are not evil, but letting our horse lead us through life is. But we are not the horse. We are the rider. The rider has a horse, much in the same way that we are a soul and our soul has a body. The rider is all about the destination. The rider has places to go. The rider has to take care of its horse. And we have to take care of our bodies. The rider seeks to train the horse and to direct it towards their destination. Similarly, we have to train our bodies and lead the way. But just like the rider needs a horse to get anywhere, our soul needs our bodies to get anywhere. The goal is for the horse and the rider to get close to each other so that they can work together in tandem, so that they're no longer struggling one against the other. Because the truth is the horse can come to want to serve its master. And the truth is that our bodies tend to speak louder than our souls. Our bodies speak to us in the first person. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. But our soul usually speaks to us in the third person. You know, you should pray. You know, you should study some Torah now. You should give some charity today. The body speaks in the first person. I'm hungry. The soul is not as loud. It speaks to us in the third person. But if the rider does his job, the horse will want to go along. And the same gusto with which a person eats a steak will be harnessed to go to a Torah class. Our dust can become spiritual just like our breath. When the rider is able to train his horse to work in tandem with him, he has succeeded in the struggle and the test of life. And so Rabbi Lutzato explains as follows. Since the period of earning and that of reward are different, it is appropriate that our environment and experiences be different in the two. While he is striving toward perfection, he must be in a setting containing elements necessary for such. The period of earning must therefore be one where a maximum challenge exists and where the physical and the spiritual are in a constant state of strife. But in the period of reward, however, 
the exact opposite is appropriate. The more the physical would prevail there, the more it would darken the soul and prevent it from being drawn close to God. During the time of reward, it is therefore appropriate that the soul prevail and that the physical be totally subjugated to it and not restrain it at all. It's for this reason that God created two worlds, this world and the world to come. The environment and principles of the world to come are what are necessary for a person during the time that he receives his reward. Now I mentioned there's a second reason for sending our souls down into this physical world and into a body. And that is to provide an important means of drawing close to God. The Talmud teaches us that one of the most powerful ways for us to bind and attach ourselves to God is by becoming more godly ourselves, by following the ways of God. For example, just as God is generous and giving and merciful and compassionate, so when we act in these ways towards other people, we are becoming more like God and we're drawing closer to him. Now, one thing that we know about God is that he is a creator. By sending us into a body, into a physical world, we now have the opportunity to become creators just like God and thereby, thereby bond with him. How do we create and what do we create? So the truth is that God made everything in the universe unilaterally through his speech. God said, let there be light, let there be trees, let there be zebras. But when it came to the human being, God said, let us make man. And the Hasidic masters explain that he was speaking to every person who will ever live. God was essentially saying, I cannot simply create you like I created everything else in existence fully formed. I can give you the raw ingredients. I can give you a body and a soul. But who you will be is a function of what you make of yourself, what you do with these raw ingredients. So God sent us into this world to create ourselves and become creators just like him. And we create ourselves by exercising our free will, again, another divine quality, and by balancing and perfecting the unique tensions between our bodies and our souls. And in becoming creators and actualizing our potential, we resemble God and draw closer to him, which is the ultimate goal of why we were alive in the first place. Now, as we go through life, the more we are in touch with our souls, the more we can appreciate and apprehend God. The Talmud in Tractate Brachot 10a teaches that just as God fills the entire universe, our soul fills our entire body. And just as God sees but is not seen, so too our soul sees but is not seen. Just as God gives nourishment to the entire world, our soul gives nourishment to the entire body. Just as God is pure, so too the soul is pure. Just as God dwells in the inner chambers, so too does the soul dwell within the inner chambers. And the Talmud concludes by saying, let the one who has these five qualities come and praise the one who has these five qualities. 
Now, there is a difference of opinion among our sages about the ultimate disposition of the soul. Maimonides, who was a rationalist living in the 12th century, maintained that the world to come is where a person's soul goes after they die. It's called the world to come because we're not there yet, not because it doesn't exist yet. It exists side by side alongside our present world. And when a person dies, their soul enters olam haba, the world to come. And Maimonides explains that after the advent of the messianic age, there will be a resurrection of the dead. Now, why would that happen? Why would the dead be resurrected and their souls that are now in the world to come reunite for a second time with a physical body? It seems counterproductive. So Maimonides maintains that it's not counterproductive. Even though it's true that the soul is now in heaven, so to speak, receiving its reward, Maimonides maintains that your spiritual level in the world to come is a function of what you accomplished in this world. However, he says that because so many people had difficult times and difficult lives in this world, especially all the Jews throughout history who lived through so much persecution, they will get an opportunity to come back and serve God under better conditions after they're resurrected. And after this time in the living again in the messianic world, where they get to serve God and perfect themselves to a greater degree, the person will die again. And their soul that had a chance to be upgraded will subsequently exist as a disembodied soul forever in the world to come. But this is a minority view. Nachmanides, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, a mystic writing in the 13th century expressed what became the dominant view among Jewish thinkers. And Nachmanides says that after death, the soul goes to a place called Olam Hanishamot, the world of souls. This is not the place of its ultimate reward, even though it will be a pleasant experience. In the future, however, God will create a new world, a new existence that is called Olam Haba, the world to come. And after the advent of the messianic age, there will be a resurrection of the dead. And the souls of people who died and exist in the world of souls will be taken from the world of souls and brought into the new reality of the world to come, both with a body and a soul together, albeit a less coarse and more ethereal, refined body that we have now. And together, this body and soul will experience the bliss of the world to come. And this is appropriate as a reward because ultimately it was both the body and the soul that served God in this world. So both should experience eternal reward. So even though you are really a soul, if you want to understand who you are, each of us is really a soul. But our soul's existence is bound up with its body. The rider needs its horse just as much as the horse needs its rider. God intended for them to function in tandem. As we see from the following Talmudic analogy from Tractate Sanhedrin 91a. In this passage from the Talmud, Antoninus, we know as Mark Anthony, 
said to Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Judah the Prince, the two had a tremendously close relationship. So Antoninu said to Rabbi, the body and the soul can exempt each other in the heavenly judgment. He said, how is that so? Well, the body can say, it was the soul that's responsible for transgressions, for since the day that it departed from me, from the day that the soul departed from me, the body says, I've been lying in the grave like an inert stone, and I'm not capable of doing anything. So obviously I wasn't responsible for sinning. But the soul can say, no, it was the body that transgressed. Since the day that I separated from it, I've been soaring in the air like a bird, and I'm not capable of sinning. So Rebbe said to Antoninus, I'll give you an analogy to explain this. This is like the case of a human king who had a beautiful orchard with delectable fruit. He placed two guards in the orchard. One was lame and the other was blind. And the lame one said to the blind one, you know, I can see beautiful fruit here in this orchard. Come and place me on your shoulders. I'm lame, I can't move. So he says to the blind one, come and place me on your shoulders and we will get some fruit and eat it. So the lame man rode on the blind man's shoulders and they fetched the fruits and ate them. Eventually the owner of the orchard came and said, where are my beautiful fruits? And the lame man said, do I have legs to walk with? What are you looking at me for? And the blind man said, do I have eyes to see? I couldn't do anything. So the owner immediately placed the lame man on the shoulders of the blind man and judged them as one. Similarly, the Holy One, blessed be he, will bring the soul and cast it into a body and judge them together. Ultimately, we are a soul, which is spiritual, which is eternal. And therefore, you never die. No one ever dies. Your earth suit, your body, will one day return to the earth from where it came, but you, the essence of who you are, will never cease to exist.